Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Chris Hart and I'm associated with Manchester University Press and I'm delighted that you're all joining us for what promises to be an excellent event of what is an excellent book, Power, Politics and Influence at Work. So today's all-star panel includes authors Tony Dundon, Miguel Martinez-Lucio, Emma Hughes, Deborah Howcroft, Arjun Kaiser and Roger Walden. So everyone at the press is excited about bringing you today's event. I'd just like to do some housekeeping. So on your screen, you should see an event dashboard containing the options to raise questions. This is for you to type questions throughout the talk, which the panel will hopefully get around to answering during the Q&A section at the end of the event. So all I'd say is please do ask questions because from the events we've already done, I know the authors really appreciate this interaction with the audience. So I'd like to say a big thank you to the panel for participating today. And I'd like to extend that thanks to everyone who's tuned in to watch. So without any more from me, I'm now gonna hand over to Tony. Thank you very much, Chris. And I think uh, I think we've got Roger's dog in the background there. So a nice yeah, welcome sorry, from, from the new dog, Roger. Uh, that's great. Uh, you could mute if you want. Anyway, look, welcome everyone uh, who's joined us today. So we're, we're just giving a launch and to talk about our book um, that we we're all involved in. And maybe just uh, I'll set the scene. You know, the book is it's purposely short. It's not a textbook. And what we decided it was it was a conversation around a set of issues about work and employment and how work and voice and participation is influenced at work. So in doing this book, we put together our aim was to try and engage a more, say, activist audience, those who might be interested in the labour market issues of equalities and inequalities. So we discussed things like voice and participation. We discussed regulation and the role of the state. We summarise a number of potential scenarios and future developments but in setting out the idea of power and politics we thought well a couple of frameworks become important so French and Raven we look at that in terms of you know coercive power or power from legitimacy or where you sit in an organization people may or may not be familiar we talk about Luke's different faces of power you know, if you can control the agenda in a workplace meeting, then that's a dominance of power. Or issues of, you know, Gramsci talks of hegemonic power. We also look at things from a colleague, Dolgast. And Dolgast and her, her research has looked at ideas of solidarities and how institutions can support or undermine collective solidarities. So that's the sort of backdrop to these forces influencing decision making and voice in work. We also were hope we're not pessimistic in the book. Um, things are pretty bad. Things have been pretty dim the last year with COVID. And we were finishing the book when COVID, the COVID pandemic sort of hit. So there's a couple of relevant references to, uh, to, the, to the pandemic throughout the book, but not, not in any great detail. But we draw on the, these issues of collective solidarities, of organizing, of representing and voicing and regulating. So there's a there's a slide, Chris, that you might put up because we sought to create a interdisciplinary network of, of disciplines, of economics, of labor history, of labor process, sociology. So again, building on much of the work from Miguel, we have um, sort of summarized six elements or dimensions to power and politics and sort of broadly labeled it work and employment studies. So the indeterminacy of labor, the indeterminacy of workers can have an influence on how much effort they exercise in their job. And management actions and management choices and the utilizations of technology. So they're reviewed in, in chapter two, globalization and the regulation of the nation state. So chapters two and three, look at those sort of issues. The notion of voice and the communication sphere and the regulatory spaces around voice and collective bargaining. Other tactics to bring in uh, sort of non uh, CSOs and non government organizations. And in using those dimensions, then we sort of map a couple of possible future scenarios. So that's me just sketching out the rationale for the book, its purpose, its idea of being a sure conversation around these types of issues. And I'll pass over to Deborah, who is going to talk about some of those in a little more detail as we go through. Thank you, Tony. 
So in the book, we outline how the balance of power between employers and employees goes beyond the workplace uh, and is shaped by various socio-economic developments. So we look at things like financialization, globalization, and also te technological change. So these structural shifts have got consequences, uh, and the consequences impact things like labor markets, mobility, uh, the demand for skills, quality and quantity of jobs. And over the last few years, what we've seen is a real sort of decline in the standard employment relationship as growing numbers of workers are faced with variations in terms of flexibilized and fragmented contracts. So if we step back and ask the question, is work getting worse? Conjunctural conditions point to an overall deterioration and a reduction um, of job security. And as Tony said, we obviously, uh, when we were looking at these kinds of uh, developments that impact and shape work, we never predicted the pandemic. Um, and the pandemic in itself has accelerated many of these changes and it's generated both continuities and discontinuities. So in that sense, I'd just like to cover three key issues. Uh, the first is that I think the pandemic has highlighted the criticality of frontline labour, uh, labour that's largely undervalued. So health and social care workers, bus drivers, refuse collectors, uh, retail workers. Uh, many of these workers have sacrificed their own personal safety, uh, yet they are least likely to be protected in terms of employment rights. Secondly, we've seen an unprecedented move to home working. So despite claims in the 1980s of the end of the office, the prospect of large scale teleworking failed to materialise. Uh, with only 5% of the UK workforce teleworking in, in, by 2019. So it was one of those kind of uh, technological hypes that never quite uh, delivered as people anticipated. And a lot of this limited take up was attributed to um, the problems of uh, lack of trust. And so this kind of work was very much kind of uh, seen as a perk for the more privileged uh, cadre of uh, managers and professional workers. But of course, COVID changed all of this um, and we saw the first en masse uh, relocation of lower grade white collar work. In April 2020, the proportion of the workforce that was home working was more than 40 percent. Uh, and this is now uh, it's kind of stabilised at around 25 percent, which is why you see so many cars on the road still. Um, and, and this includes uh, a, a significant number of employees, such as office administrators and call centre agents, and they face kind of digitalised monitoring in the absence of the usual form of visibility. So while there's a lot of talk about uh, the success of Zoom, um, what is less reported is the massive increase in the purchase by corporations of digital surveillance software. So these changes that were viewed initially as a sort of emergency response to the pandemic have led to suggestions that the future of work will be remote. So numerous employers like Gartner and Capital One, PayPal, they've announced that there will be a permanent move to working from the home, uh, enabling them to capitalise on city centre rent savings. Yet the case of the government's DVLA call centre with more than 500 COVID cases serves as a useful reminder of the reluctance of employers to allow people to work from home, even when they fail to implement safeguards in the workplace. And finally, the effects of the pandemic on the labour market is likely to leave uh, lasting traces as temporary um, layoffs and furloughed workers kind of translate then into permanent job losses, especially in hard hit sectors. And the ILO have recently reported that unemployment is likely to be four times higher than the period following the financial crisis. And years of austerity have already taken their toll. Uh, most post-recessionary employment involve part-time work, zero-hour contracts and self-employment. But as both unemployment and in-work poverty look set to increase, even more people will be seeking new ways to make ends meet. So we can expect to see an increase in areas like platform labour, the digital manifestation of fragmentation. So we need to ask ourselves what these changes mean for the way in which voice has to reinvent itself, which Emma will go on to discuss next. Thank you. Yeah, hi there. Uh, my name is Roger Walden. 
Um, you've heard my dog, so that's, that's, that's all, all good. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the third chapter of the book, and, I, and we're, we're looking at themes rather than trying to do a summary of the book, um, but it, it looks at the nature and role of the state as a social institutional actor, which broadly sets the policy framework and ultimately the extent of legal and regulatory intervention. Uh, I mean, over the last 40 years, pretty much worldwide, we've seen um, the state or states involved in or fostering um, or overseeing the decline of trade union membership uh, and undermining work of voice through uh, the decollectivization of industrial relations. Uh, 2019 figures tell us that, you know, that as few as 10.3% you know, um, on average of American workers are in trade unions, for example. However, you know, the, the level of regulation and intervention uh, and, and legal uh, intervention at any given time will depend on, upon the interplay of various forces. Uh, it would depend on the balance of power between the state uh, employers, employees, trade unions, quite clearly, um, and in some contexts, and in particular in the UK, uh, the judiciary. Um, Chris, could I have the, the second slide there? Yeah. Um, interestingly, I mean, we know that the, the essential relationship between uh, individual employers and organizations and individual employees are characterized by an imbalance of economic power and as you can see um, this is not some left-wing uh, radical uh, concept that is being uh, ex ex um, discussed here this is the supreme court this comes from a judgment of the supreme court in the case on tribunal fees in 2017 recognizing that essential imbalance between workers or employers and employees and the vulnerability of employees to exploitation, discrimination, and other undesirable practices and social problems which can result. So this is not a radical leftist conspiracy. This is you know, the UK Supreme Court institutionally, probably very conservative, you'd argue. And we know that Kahn Freund uh, has historically said and, and reiterated again and again um, in his 1977 book, Labour and the Law, and, and subsequently, that on the employee side, power is in the main collective power. And we've already seen that there has been a decline in collective power through the decline in trade union membership uh, and support for, and perhaps even antipathy towards, collective bargaining as a mode of regulating the workplace. The question is, you know, and again, as Tony said, um, you know, the book was largely written and, and almost going to press before COVID. Uh, the question is, you know, does COVID, you know, and the, the massively extended intervention of the state through furlough and, and many other initiatives, does that really change the situation fundamentally or is it a temporary aberration? And I think I would argue that we're more likely to see a return to the status quo ante in relation to the approach towards workers, uh, their collective organisations, uh, and, and their place in inverted commas, um, or even further deregulation of workers' rights in favour of employees. As an example of that, I'd point to uh, Australian proposals that have been introduced in the Australian Parliament, um, which is going to, for example, replace in, in the Australian context what is normally a better off overall test for the approval of enterprise uh, workplace agreements uh, with a test which means that employees generally and some employees can be disadvantaged by changes which will take into account the impact of COVID on the employer's organisation. So what does this essential imbalance of bargaining power mean for individual rights? And over time, over the last you know, 30 or 40 years, there seem to be more employment rights. You know, I'm an employment lawyer and there are a vast range of rights. There are a vast range of potential jurisdictions, which say employment tribunals in the UK context have over employment rights. The problem is that what you've seen with decollectivization is at the same time, the juridification and individualization of rights. 
Uh, and that, in, you know, that, that really you know, gives rise to a whole range of persistent difficulties with, for example, establishing the rights, establishing your status. So we do look in the chapter at issues around employment status, issues around marginal workers, gig workers, where you know, their, their, their status is uncertain. And we see again, the intervention of our courts, now senior courts, including the Supreme Court, um, arguably supporting to some extent those rights of, of, of the workers, um, where they see again this imbalance of bargaining power in cases like Zulagi uh, and others. So we see these similar problems of establishing rights, access to rights and enforcement in areas of discrimination, in areas of discrimination and equality, the rights of basically migrant and other similar groups of workers. These problems are not going away. I personally don't think that COVID is going to change very much fundamentally in the medium to long term. I think we'll re revert to um, issue, uh, a situation where employees are having to struggle for voice. I'm, I'm probably one of the more negative um, contributors to the book in this regard. Um, and, you know, problems with trying to reestablish or establish new forms of collective organisation. So there are, there are big issues there. And obviously there's a COVID context, which I've already referred to as potentially a temporary aberration. And in the UK, there's the Brexit context. Um, and we've seen Kwasi Kwarteng um, allegedly uh, saying that the business department review of employment rights in the context of exit from the EU um, has, has been shelved or has been abandoned. I'm not sure that'll persist as a position for too long. Uh, with that, I'll then turn over to Emma, who may have uh, something more positive to say about issues around voice and new forms of organisation. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. In chapter four, we focus on who speaks for whom at work and key here is the concept of employee voice. So work is having a say over work and employment matters. We discuss union participation, for example, through collective bargaining at industry or workplace levels. And we also explain how research has demonstrated that greater collective bargaining coverage at national level linked to lower social inequalities. Another form of voice we cover in the chapter comes from newer and highly diverse external actors beyond the workplace, for example, civil society organisations. Can I have the slide up here, please, Chris? That's great, thank you. Overall, we argue in the chapter that worker voice has become disjointed and fragmented as many employers fail to provide workers with meaningful opportunities for voice, notably collective voice, which is arguably the most powerful form of worker influence. We cover how union participation is constrained by the union avoidance strategies that employers adopt, which then undermines opportunities for greater equality at workplace level and also more broadly. However, we try to adopt a positive outlook on worker voice and we unpack the tension between the fragmentation, the, sorry, the fragmentation of voice on the one hand and also opportunities for change on the other hand. So union campaigns have been resilient over the past few years and this is an important point because in 2019 the Department for Business Innovation and Skills reported an increase in union membership for three consecutive years and also an increase in union density for two consecutive years. They are only small increases but they nonetheless 
challenge and disrupt this idea of a permanent decline in unionisation. Equally, civil society groups are creating novel spaces for um, new forms of voice over a wide range of issues. Now, during the pandemic, this tension between the fragment fragmentation of voice on the one hand and opportunities for change and new voice forms on the other hand is acute because because of the abrupt shift to home working, traditional processes of solidarity amongst workers are constrained. But on the other hand, we're seeing digital campaigns organised by civil society organisations and NGOs or unions, which are creating new innovative platforms for voice. Unions were at the forefront of pushing for government intervention over pay and sick pay during the pandemic. They've also been engaging with the state over health and safety issues, which shows that greater social dialogue between unions and the state is valuable at the workplace level and also at the broader societal level. And I'm going to pass on to Miguel. OK, <clears throat> thank you, Emma. Um, I'll, I'll finish this. I think um, Tony will come back into it. So uh, the book, as Emma said, is trying to emphasise this uh, question of participation of voice, but its expansion and the kind of way in which issues such as home working or platform work and a whole range of changes are kind of on a one level fragmenting voice, but as Emma said, beginning to create a whole new set of broader dynamics. The final chapter um, very much um, draws on debates and issues and differences of opinion, optimistic versus pessimistic, as Roger said, because there are competing, competing perspectives, I think. Um, but the final chapter tries to end on the fact that the future is not clearly written, regardless of the very difficult circumstances that we're in. And as a book that was meant for activists to try and move away from some of the more traditional kind of activist space and was by trying to open it up politically as well, as opposed to just a, a kind of trade union kind of debate on bargaining and so forth, to say that there are many options taking place. So a whole this set of debates on scenarios, developments and so forth were drawn on. And that there is much to fight for, and there are many kind of alternative political scenarios. Although seem that as we were writing them, things seem to be opening. There's a lot of Saunders, Podemos, Corbyn, there was a whole range of, regardless of one's point of view, a lot of kind of things were happening and alternative possibilities in terms of return to certain types of state intervention, but they were closing very rapidly as well. So um, you can imagine also with the pandemic that makes various issues. But the point we're trying to make in the final chapter is that the future is not clearly written and there's a room for agency. In terms of the developments that are outlined, clearly there's a negative scenario, which is how would the current context lead to greater deregulation, increasing coercive state practices, an emphasis on surveillance. Um, there obviously is that kind of uh, negative scenario and how that can play out, especially with, in the context of the United Kingdom, real issues around trade union uh, participation and voice in terms of the state and the constraints that continue to exist. But there are different developments, different sets of issues and work by Hyman and many others. And there's a whole set of discussions here. And we've tried to add a few along these lines. The state has to guarantee minimum rights of some form or another. Um, and the question is how these minimum wages, living wages are utilized positively or utilized to limit worker voice further. There has to be a baseline equality measure set of measures in terms of equality, but how far they will be developed, how much they will be deepened is another issue. The state would not disappear. And the whole issue around furloughs has shown that as well. The state kind of gets drawn back in, but gets to be, gets to be drawn back in in a very fragmented manner. Fortunately or unfortunately, the other developments are that questions of CSR, rhetoric of well-being, all those kind of soft or sometimes hard managerial approaches will nevertheless continue to exist and be a challenge. They would try to usurp voice, um, but nevertheless, 
they will be contested. So also firms will try to intervene as well. And as one said, th those are you know concurrent scenarios as well. And there's a lot of push towards what we would call partnership-based approaches or what Luis Alonso calls, and as we quote, micro-level corporatist approaches. There's no doubt business-facing approaches. Companies may be un un uncertain, and I'll finish soon, uncertain with collectivism, but they will still be trying to reconstruct collectivism. So there's all kinds of complexities. But the one that we try to draw out of the two, which is important in a range of the literature, is the fact that there are new forms of organizations and new forms of mobilizations within and beyond the established trade union movement. You know, there's journals like Work Employment Society have spent a lot of time looking at these types of issues, not just about independent unions, but social movements and so forth, the work of Heary, the work of David Burrow, Gabriela Bretti. There's a whole literature on multiplicity, multiplicity of voices at the micro and macro level. And one thing we try to end up on is the fact that coalition building and alliances is going to be, I don't want to end up on this saying, we use the word skill, but it's going to be a skill that trade union activists and political activists are going to have to develop even further because of the nature of the competing participants and the way in which coalitions will need to be built, progressive coalitions, left coalitions, trade union coalitions, whatever, around questions of worker rights. So it's quite interesting. And ultimately, you know, the state hasn't disappeared. The question is, it's teetering us to, it's re it's reintervening, but maybe the projects that we saw at the beginning of the book aren't as um, consolidated as we, we, we hope they would be. Um, so the aim of the book is very much to reach out to a wider audience and to, to kind, of, kind of, in a sense, create a greater attention to these issues of participation, but also to this permanent shift in the actors of industrial relations, that's very different, different to say books that we benchmark against, like May Day Rest in Peace, Frank Birchall and Tom Kinoy, which did very important practical invitations to industrial relations many years ago. Hopefully, we can add to that tradition of employment relations contributing by, you know, broadening it. So I'll leave it to you. Thank you, Mark. I need to un <clears throat> unmute myself, of course. So thanks, thanks everyone. That's a so that's a bit of a you know a quick tour of the book. The, there are five chapters in the book. As I said at the beginning, it was purposely short. Uh, it was to create a conversation to stimulate perhaps discussions of activists of policymakers rather than the textbook type of mode for for learning. There's a there's a final slide, Chris, if you don't mind throwing that up, and then we'll open it out to the Q and A. So there's the image of the book uh, on the left hand side, and and there was five, there's five chapters, five short chapters. But just to add, we we also developed uh, an online course around the book, and as Miguel said, there's a whole set of networks and activists, and the online course develops some of those conversations further. So the book provides a, a platform of discussion and then you can log on to this course, the same title, Power, Politics and Influence at Work. And there are interviews, video interviews with Oxfam, with NGOs, with trade union leaders. Um, Frances O'Grady provided a, a forward to, to the book uh, where she outlines the ideas of engaging in conversations for activism. So at that point, I'll, I'll leave it there, Chris, and perhaps pass over to you and we can have a discussion uh, or any questions that people may have. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate that. Thanks, everyone, for, for a great event, great talks. Um, so if you do have questions, please send them in. I think I'm going to start with uh, one of my own, which is just to, if you could just sort of articulate on the motivations around the origins of the book, well, how you all came together to support this book and what your hopes were in writing the book. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I don't mind giving a, an initial answer. We we were all collaborators uh, on 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 a number of projects r related to the Work and Equalities Institute uh, at the University of Manchester at the time. Even though we're now at different institutions and and doing slightly different things, so that project was looking at power in the workplace and in particular changing modes of voice. And on the back of that project, we then started to discuss the ideas that we'd included in that project report and to try and develop the notion of a book. So that was the, the origin and the foundation as we were working on a number of 
related research projects through the Work and Equalities Institute. And then, as Miguel said, was to try and make a contribution, not as a textbook, but as one of those shorter engaging books that people could read in a, a short space of time and create a discussion and in, and in part a provocation to some of the issues and debates that, that have been discussed or mentioned so far. I don't know if anyone else wants to add, add to that background. I think it was also to try and target a broader audience, wasn't it, which links to what you've just said now. So we were trying to target union representatives and civil society organisations and um, NGOs rather than just targeting students in university, maybe people who haven't been able to go to university. I think that's what was one, that's what one of the main aims were, I think, if I remember. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's the point of, of linking the book to the MOOC as well, um, an open access course which is free uh, to subscribe to and aimed very particularly at activists, people in work who might not otherwise get access to these sorts of uh, sources. No. Great, thanks. I, I've got a question coming from Greg. Uh, to Greg, uh, uh, but, but congratulations on publishing this timely and important book. It's great to see that you have been endorsed, see that it, sorry, it has been endorsed and welcomed by Francis O'Grady of the TUC and Sally McManus, Secretary of the Australian Council of Trade Unions. Uh, so he's asked, I wonder what reception has your book received so far from unions and activists in practice in the UK and elsewhere? unmuted myself assuming I might answer but I don't know if anyone else wants to wants to answer um, I'm not I'm not quite sure what what it hasn't received a negative reception uh, we haven't heard anything negative we we've seen a couple of UK and Irish trade union leaders have circulated links to the book um, largely because I think they were included on this discussions on the online course um, so the TUC education officer in the UK and a regional uh, IC2 officer in Ireland, I know I've circulated it, and as, as Greg said, there's Sally McManus in Australia has endorsed the book. So there's been, from our end, there's been some marginal links to trade unions publicising the book, um, but we haven't had any direct feedback as, as yet from, from any trade unions, per se. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that um, most of what we get in terms of feedback, broadly speaking, has come from the MOOC. Um, and so, for example, I, I know you know, we, we had very positive responses from the Secretary of the Northwest uh, Unison Community Union branch, uh, who a number of his colleagues were, you know, went on the MOOC um, and responded very favourably to it. Um, so, as I say, we, 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 you know, uh, obviously the book was published what, August, September last year, and because of COVID and everything, we've only just now got to having our formal launch event you might say um so yeah uh any feedback is welcome and appreciated we are just it's been we are on the mooc is did get quite a few hundred people coming to it and it's the second this week or next week i think is the second round of the mooc as well so i think we'll be expecting people on that it's possible to say that trade union education is changing as well becoming more focused than around specific issues um Maybe the space for this would have been stronger 20, 30 years ago, but that's why we're doing it. You know, I'm trying to say because I think there's a need to, you know, labour history, you know, trade union politics in a broader sense. Um, so it'd be interesting actually to kind of because we are pursuing, I'm not just trying to sell the book, but we are pursuing further links, and I think it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Okay, thank you. Two seconds. I've just got another question coming. Uh, uh, so I, I guess with regards to um, whether you could write this book about specific industries and themselves, so whether obviously there's a lot of changes going on within the university and more from the university sort of background and sector, including the press, um, whether you could write this sort of book with regards to just the university and what would the three biggest issues be, do you think, for the university? Throw that curveball in. Yeah, who wants to go with that? Emma? You might yeah, go, yeah, I'll go. yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think we um, could 
write a book just on the university. Maybe we should do that, everyone. <laughs> Hint, but um, yeah, we. I think we see what we talk about in the book. We are seeing the same issues in the university context. In the university context, we do perhaps have more a little bit more autonomy in the job compared to uh, lower skilled workers who are maybe working in the gig economy although you could say that some workers in university now are in some ways gig economy workers because they haven't got that security and they're relying on um just on teaching here and there whenever they can get it or just research contracts here and there whenever they're available. In terms of the major issues, probably around performance management and how that's putting so much pressure on academics. Um, but also the big thing now is how technology is going to impact universities going forward. I think we've seen the way that technology has changed our role now, it's very difficult to know how it's going to play out in the future. Um, I don't know if anybody else yeah. has got anything to say about the issues. I think Deborah had it, or, or Roger, yeah. I don't know. Deborah, Deborah. Yeah, just to add uh, to what Emma said, I think uh, in terms of the sort of like relevance to the university sector, the issue of work fragmentation and also the types of contracts that are being offered to staff is really critical. Um, working at the University of Manchester, which probably many of you have seen on the news recently, will provide a brilliant case study, actually. And I think also if we think about this as well in terms of online, online campaigns and organising, the students have been brilliant. Uh, their recent campaign, 9, 9K for what, which probably many of you have seen, is really sort of questioning the whole kind of structure of university education. I mean, I, I, I just add to that that um, I, I'm now semi-detached. Uh, you know, my, my nomenclature is an honorary lecturer at Manchester University. Uh, but when I was there up until two, three years ago on a full time basis, I was heavily involved in the UCU, uh, both uh, locally and nationally. Uh, at Manchester, we, we do have a great case study. Um, it shows all the worst aspects um, of management style, management approach, uh, problems with communication, uh, utilising COVID to uh, basically uh, you know, force people out or force people to feel they had to be uh, leaving the university uh, last summer before they even knew uh, what the impact with COVID would actually be. Um, they've also used it as a pretext for renegotiating um, a number of deals uh, on a whole range of issues, a number of collective bargaining agreements, which I was involved in negotiating five, six years ago. Uh, they've reopened them and tried to change them uh, and, and force change through on the basis that the university can't operate in the context of these reasonable and, and balanced agreements that we've had previously. So I think you could look at any area um, of the economy, almost any business, um, and you can see better or worse cases, um, and you could do case studies in all of them where, where you could apply a lot of the themes, principles, concepts that we use in the book yeah. to, to analyse them. Um, and certainly from the perspective of, of, of the chapter I've looked at particularly, uh, and legal and other regulatory frameworks, then um, you know, I, I, I think that's, that, that's largely um, you know, where we stand. And the question is, if we come out of COVID, will we go into a further period of austerity? Um, and will we regress back to the state of quantity or worse in terms of employee voice uh, and worker influence and worker rights? I'll come in there quickly, very quickly, because there might be other questions. But I think universities, there's a kind of set of contradictions in universities. On the one hand, I was at a conference in Dublin just before lockdown, and uh, which was on industrial democracy. And some presentations held up British universities as an example in the past of not pure industrial democracy. Let's not get too excited. We're also very sexist, racist institutions. But as the role of the Senate and all these kind of issues were very important. So on the one hand, we've seen a decline in that voice and influence within universities, right? And that's 
why universities are a good case. On the other hand, we've seen a lot of trade union renewal, you know, in various forms through a whole new generation of activists and uh, whole new forms of representation, new types of cultural practices in terms of trade unions and alliances. So it expresses all the contradictions of change, but voice hasn't gone away, but there is an issue of, in a sense, um, governance, I suppose, which is a problem because it links to the issue of corporate governance uh, as well, which is something which needs further work. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry, Tony. No, go on, Chris. I was going to, just going to say thanks for the question. Any, oh, any no, I've got a question in from Tony, actually, who's, uh, who's asked, if you were in government, uh, what policies would you prioritise to reduce imbalances of power at work? And I think I might change that slightly because of time. Mm -hmm. Just say, what three policies would you prioritise to reduce imbalances of power at work? Which three would you focus on straight away? Mine would be regulation, regulation and regulation. So in other words, to provide rights for people in work, to provide legislation, that makes a difference. I'll pass on to someone else if they want a quick comment. I mean, I, I'd, I'd certainly agree with that, um, but it's not just a matter of putting rights on statute books or in, into regulatory frameworks. It's making it you know, clear that people need to have access to those rights and be provided with support for so doing, um, and that those rights are adequately enforced, uh, whether it be individually and, and in many areas, I think probably better off uh, would be collectively. Uh, because as I've said before, the big problem we've had is that there is more law on the statute book than ever in many countries, but it doesn't actually mean you've got rights that are you're able to operationalize because of the individualization of those rights and and, and the, you know, the fragmentation and isolation of individuals when you've got a decline in trade unions and collective bargaining frameworks. Spot on. Pity we're not in government though. <laughs> Anybody else? I mean I, I, can, I could come in if you want, but I, I think worker ownership is going to be key to this. I think there is a return to, you know, worker ownership, nationalisation, uh, which the government's doing. I mean, the government's level of intervention is way beyond economically what Corbyn was actually even, you know, going to propose. So in a kind of weird way, the, the issue is, I think, uh, worker ownership, cooperatives. Um, I've just reviewed a book that's come out, a very good book on the alternative economic strategy, which shows you how old some of us are getting. <laughs> but uh, just rethinking the economy, which has to run parallel with regulation. And I think equality is key in terms of a much broader definition of equality. Okay, thank you. So, can I, do you want me to say something as well, Chris? Or it's okay, we can go on if not. No, no, I've got, I've got one final question, but yeah, no, you please do, Emma, you do, sis. Yeah, okay, well, I was just going to say, um, I'd probably say around equality as well, like Miguel said, I think, you know, we've got, we know that equality and diversity are major issues, and companies have got endless initiatives to try and enhance equality and diversity, but there's something still majorly wrong so i think definitely around equality policy around equality and then the gig economy because well we know with the gig economy the security of contracts is again something that we should be prioritizing i think um and then collective voice as so that links to what roger is saying i think everyone should have the opportunity to be represented by a union so that could be maybe um more sectoral bargaining or to try and yeah to, to try and reach people who are marginalized in society or who are typically marginalized in society and might not have access to union organizing usually sorry i'll stop there now <laughs> just one more point i think that uh comes on you know, or follows on from what Emma's saying you know we, we've got on the one hand more law and legislation we've also got more employer policies than ever on a whole vast range of issues uh, the question is how effective are they um, are they properly monitored are people and managers properly trained in their use and application um, are things as Miguel said like you know well-being policies uh, really addressing issues of, of mental ill health and work-related psychiatric injury I would argue not. I think that they are rather like occupational health departments or occupational health 
um, provisions uh, and you know, counselling, etc. They've been put there rather to um, you know, provide the, the presentation or veneer of employer um, compliance with their legal obligations, but maybe obscuring the, the fact that's not really happening in practice. So it's the same issue of more stuff, more law, more policies, more processes, but are they being um, effectively put into operation and, and can employees activate them and utilise them effectively? I would also add that um, I think there's huge investment needed in uh, the public sector, supporting, developing and growing the public sector and avoiding all the sort of private contracting that we see uh, as it's as huge projects are basically outsourced to incompetent chums of the government. Yes, Thank as you. with track and trace. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So I'm going to end with a, a more general question now. I've got a few people have asked about this, so I'll just wrap it up into one single question. Can you just say something more about the, the online course, the MOOC, in terms of uh, the content, you know, how you structured the content, maybe if you've got any uh, data on uh, who's att who attended the MOOC or, you know, from uh, backgrounds or whether it went to students, etc. Yeah, just briefly. I mean, the the MOOC, the online course, uh, is free. Uh, anyone can sign up for it. I think it's I think it's open to enrol now, and I think its first week runs in about the. I think it's in early February. Maybe next week might be. Oh, when it, I think it's next Monday, isn't it? Yeah. Next Monday, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So it it follows the same pattern as the book. So each chapter of the book is a, is a week learning of the course. There's a few additional links when you log in, uh, you enrol, you start, uh, there's a couple of video interviews from, from several of us, uh, introducing the chapter, introducing the themes of the week. Then there's, there might be a short article in the conversation or an academic article in addition to the book chapter. And then there's an interview with one or two people. There's an interview with Virginia Dolgas, for instance, from Cornell University in week one, talking about the models of power, of influence, of collective solidarities. In week two, there's issues of the gig economy, of new technology, and likewise, there's interviews with a number of people on those issues. And it follows the pattern of the book. You don't need the book to follow the course, but it certainly helps. I mean, the the platform that it's delivered through is FutureLearn, which lots of universities uh, and institutes of learning use as the digital platform uh, on which to disseminate uh, short online learning. But it's a standalone course. It's it's learning structured over five weeks, and it follows the five chapters of the book. I don't know if anyone else, or Miguel, or anyone wants to add um, to that but it was an it was an interesting project to do I've never done anything like that before mm -hmm. so it was trying to bring what we we tried to write a book which wasn't a textbook that was the first thing and the second thing was this idea of trying to bring it to life through through interviews with people uh, interviews with academics with activists with trade unionists with NGOs so I found it enjoyable it's a it's a more socially engaging type of project and work than, than you often find in a business school. So it's reaching out beyond the, the boundaries and the walls of the university and the business school, which I found very, very enjoyable indeed. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the only point I'd add to that is you know, that there are short um, tests that aren't, aren't really an attempt to uh, filter people out. They're, they're, they're just sort of some revision points that people have, which they, they just address before they move on to the next week. Um, but I think there is also a facility um, for getting a certificate that, that, you know, so the MOOC itself is completely free and, and completing the MOOC is completely free. You can get a formal certificate, which I think it costs 42 quid or something, um, which I'm, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of. But if people wanted to have that as, 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 a, as a useful um, addition, then that can be done. I think also in terms of data, so there's probably, so I think the question somebody asked about data, I think there's probably maybe scope for us to look more at the data in terms of who has actually participated in the MOOC, um, why they participated and so forth. They do, they distribute a survey at the end of the MOOC asking questions and we did look into it very complex the way that they distribute the survey but they distribute the survey um, and they ask questions for example why you wanted to complete the MOOC and so forth 
we wanted to add some of our extra questions, but then you can't do that. You can't answer their initial survey, so it got quite complex. But we can look into that in the future. And I think also something that we were all interested in and found quite um, it. It was quite fulfilling in some ways is that the debates that the learners were having around work they were really good debates and they were sharing interesting experiences of how they find work really and the challenges that they face and we had we've had people from a variety of different industries um all talking about what their view is on work, which I think is quite fascinating, really. Don't know if anybody else yeah, has got and, and, and obviously, uh, you know, a, a significant international uh, you know, group of students or, or people coming in to, to look at the MOOC as well and, and take part in it. So it, it had that international um, comparative dimension uh, as well as the industrial and, and uh, whatever. Uh, to mention to it that Emma just mentioned. Yeah, and, I, and just very quickly, I think that there's always a debate around MOOCs and technology, but one of the contradictions at the moment for universities is, is that uh, as we've all been tooling up on the technology and re-skilling re, re ourselves, right, um, the possibility is there to create new forms of democratic access, I think, and I think there's a kind of a curious possibility um mm -hmm. in accessing new types of different groups of workers because uh, lots of groups of workers have been um, excluded lots of individuals are excluded we get very few trade unionists on master's degrees um as we did 20 30 40 years ago so anyway great thank you thank you everyone so i mean what i'll aim to do now is i'm going to try and get the recording of this event out for friday and i'll uh, i'll attach a link to the mooc as well so if people just follow a look at the MUP social media feeds. You'll see a link to the MOOC and the recording of this event as well. That's my aim for Friday. But I think that's a good opportunity, a good moment now to wrap up. Uh, just right. to say thank you to everyone who's attended today, uh, but also big thanks to the panel. It's been a really informative and excellent talk. Um, if if people are interested in getting hold of a copy, the book is available at all good booksellers. I would say personally, from the information that news is quite today, I think Amazon have got enough money. There's many good independent booksellers out there. We're doing online books, uh, yep. online bookshops. They can source a copy for you. But likewise, you can buy it from the MUP website, and I'll send out an email tomorrow with a link and a discount code, uh, which you can access the book. But uh, leaves me just to say thanks again to everyone, uh, and I hope you all have a good day and a uh, yeah, good weekend as well. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks very much, all. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Oh. I don't know.